Hello everybody, this is Purge, bringing you guys a brand new series, it's going to be called Dota 2 Fear Bomb. Welcome to everybody that's tuning into this. Uh, I'm going to make these about once a week or something like that until I have a pretty big playlist of games cast in this vein, so that if you guys do want to show somebody new to Dota 2, then you can give them this. Um, the way that I'm going to do these and going to create these videos are going to be very different from the other ways that I normally cast games. It's going to be similar to how I casted the games at TI4 which was for the newbie cast. That means I'm going to go base level with everything. I'm going to go stupidly base level. I'm going to explain what heroes do. I'm going to explain what attacking is. I'm going to explain what creeps are. I'm going to go so base level. Now, when I first uh, thought about how to do these, um, a lot of people recommend that uh, you just make some kind of a video and explain all the basics. But the problem is that it takes tons of preparation Tons of preparation. I'm not. I'm not understating that in the slightest. And it's a lot more fun if I can just pick out a random game, and we can go over it, and I can talk about whatever the heck I want. And hopefully, over the course of about ten videos, I'll pretty much cover all the basics, and it'll give you guys something to watch. And I know that I already have something similar to that, which is called Purge Cast the Pub, but that um, generally varies very heavily in terms of how detailed I'll go over it. Over the first couple of videos of those that I made, I covered uh, more. It was more like medium skill things. So if you guys already know the absolute basics of Dota 2, this is the wrong. Video. Do for you. you should go uh, probably towards Purge Cast the Pub videos, but I wanted to put these out that way I can cover all the stupid basics, and it might be a little boring for some of you guys um, if you're if you're more experienced players, but you might also pick up a couple things that you didn't know as well. So um, I'm gonna go over the complete basics. That's my intro to this. I know it was overly long and monotonous, but I'm not gonna have webcam on. I'm just gonna focus on the game and hopefully teach you guys a little bit about Dota. So welcome to Dota. Uh, I'm happy that you guys are here. I think it's a great game. I love that a lot of people are playing it and I'm happy to have other people, uh, even more people playing it as well. So I'll go cover a couple things to get you guys acclimated to this. First of all, this is the pick band screen. Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to cover this in the first in the first uh, episode or not, but but here we are. And what basically happens is in public games, aka when everybody plays a casual game, like you play a casual game, I play a casual game, usually what you play is you play all pick, which means that both teams can pretty much pick whoever they want. But when you're talking about the professional scene, and this is a game from the professional scene, what you do is you uh, allow, you choose what to pick and ban for your opponents and to prevent them from having certain lineups, prevent you from having certain lineups. Um, it's kind of a, a different tactical advantage you can have, otherwise everybody would just pick the most powerful heroes right as fast as they could. And this allows you to take turns picking, so you'll get a good hero, they'll get a good hero. It's like picking in kickball, basically. So that's entirely the point of the draft screen here. On the left, you can see all the bands really nicely organized, and in the, the middle of the screen, you can see the hero picks. And these are some of the heroes in Dota. There's a little bit over 100 heroes in Dota right now. There's still a couple that haven't been ported yet, but basically how this works is every single hero has a large uh, variety of abilities, and usually they're pretty synergistic with each other. What that means is that, for example, um, Drow Ranger's ultimate gives her a lot of agility, and agility is one of her stats which makes her do damage. And uh, that, that stacks with Precision Aura here, which gives her ranged allies bonus based on how much agility she has. So a lot of the heroes are based on uh, synergistic things. Uh, Line, for example, has a lot of disables, and he also has a big magic nuke at the end. That can uh, nuke meaning uh, uh, an ability that does a lot of burst damage with one hit. Um, that's what nukes mean. It's like a, it's a generic gaming term for uh, a little bit of burst damage, essentially. So Lion has a lot of disables, which will prevent opponents from doing things, and a lot of nukes, which do a lot of damage in burst amounts. So those two things coupled together can help you kill somebody. So Lion is a very good ganking hero, and he's actually uh, played as a support, usually. Um, to explain what roles are, it just said support. What a support role usually does is it's a hero that can contribute heavily without needing a lot of farm. And you probably don't know what farm is. Uh, what farm is, is it means the gold that you accrue by playing the game. So when we actually get into the game, I'm going to start speeding this up, by the way. And, and just keep in mind, I'm not going to focus on this game heavily. I'm not going to cast it professionally. I'm just going to cover whatever the hell I feel like talking about. Right now, I feel like talking about roles. Um, a support role is a hero that can farm or can, can contribute without needing a lot of farm. And there's a couple ways to get farm on the map. The main way is to kill little lane creeps. We haven't seen any spawn yet. All right, we're gonna we're gonna eight times this because we it's time to get into the game. We're moving moving out of talking about heroes in some ways. Um, yeah, I'm not even gonna cover these heroes this game. I don't even want to go over them individually. I'll go over their skills later, but um, support the way to get farm. You know what? We're just gonna we're gonna jump. Oh, cool! We're about to be in the game. 
by the way, this is a game from Star Series Season 11. Um, this is Fire versus Hellraisers. This was on LAN. Um, I didn't watch the game before this. Not that it matters, because we're not going to cover that stuff, but... Oh my god, pick your heroes! Jump. Jump. Okay, alright, we're into the game. Uh, I'm actually going to go back a little bit, just because I want to see... This is the map. Prepare this is Dota 2. Uh, there are two sides on Dota 2, okay? This is the first look that you have of the game. Um, this is the Radiant side of the map. It is green. I, I don't have colorblind enabled, so if you're colorblind, I'm sorry about that. But I refuse to change that, at least for now. And this is the Dire side of the map. It's a little bit more dead. has a lot more black stuff and fire and looks a little evil and stuff like that. But this is the Dire side. Uh, ignore these blue things. They're kind of... Uh, distracting, but uh, this is the dire side of the map, this is the radiant side of the map. The map is the same every single game, somehow the game is still fun to play, uh, but it really is, and the way that it works is that uh, both teams basically want to kill the enemy's ancient. So this is one ancient, this is the dire ancient over here on the fire team. On the radiant side we have the radiant ancient. This is the most important building in the game. If this dies, the game is over and you lose the game. That's that simple. So to get there, you have to go through all of these other buildings. There's buildings here, there's buildings here, there's even some buildings over here as well. I'm gonna turn my, don't mind me for a second, I'm gonna turn my scroll speed down just a little bit here. Because I don't want it to go quite as fast. All right, that's a little better. So, uh, these are the buildings that you have to go through to basically get to the throne. So loud. That sound means that the, the game is about to start. You can see the clock up here. At zero, it will start, and we'll have some creeps spawning right here. All right, so these are little creeps. So to go down and kill buildings, you basically have to be strong. At, at the beginning of the game, everybody's level one here, and they also don't have very many items. But to get items, you can check down here. This is the gold uh, the gold accrued. This is how much gold people have. You can get gold a couple different ways. You can get it by killing creeps. These are the little creeps. You can get it by killing towers, you can get it by killing heroes, and there's a couple other interesting ways that you can get it as well. But basically the entire point is to get a lot of gold. And with gold, you buy items. So if we open the shop really quick, this is going to be really overwhelming right now, but um, you buy items in the shop. It's that simple, okay? And with these items, they can sometimes combo to make uh, another item. So for example, to make power treads here, you need a boots of speed, you need a gloves of haste, and a belt of giant strength. Um, if you don't know the recipes, that's fine. You can just click through here and say, like, okay, I want to buy a Necronomicon. And then you can see the base components. So these all cost money. With the money, you get a recipe, and bam, you get an item. So basically the point of the game is to get items. And when you're getting items, it makes you stronger because it uh, allows you to do more damage. It gives you more survivability. It sometimes makes your spells do different things. There's a, Sometimes they, they give you an extra ability that you can cast or an extra spell that you can cast. There's a lot of things that you can basically do with, uh, with items. So they make you stronger, and when you become stronger, that allows you to push towers and kill heroes, and eventually you're going to kill an ancient. When you kill the ancient, the game is over and you win. So that's the basics of the game. It's about gaining gold, it's about gaining levels as well, that you can see the levels down here. With the levels it allows you to get skill points, and what you use skill points for is making your ability stronger. And this is something that goes in decision making in the game as well. You can decide, oh, do I like Shadow Rays, or do I like Necromastery more? And and understanding what which ability is more useful to get is very, very important into learning um, how to get a little bit better at Dota, or more importantly, being efficient. And, and that's a lot of Dota as well, because remember, if let's say, let's assume everybody's getting gold at the same rate, which at, whichever team makes, let's say both teams make equal team fight decisions, like they, neither team dies more than they have to, whichever team uses their gold a little bit more efficiently means that they have an advantage. And with that advantage, you can get more of an advantage over your opponents. And if you get more of an advantage over your opponents, it's harder for your opponents to come back. So this game is very based around gold and efficiency. It's really important to be efficient when you're at the highest level of the game. And again, I know this is a professional game at a big tournament, but you don't have to worry about that because it's irrelevant to the context of you guys learning Dota right now. So even though we're talking about really good players right here, the only reason I wanted to pick a pro game is because it was guaranteed to be succinct and to be organized and to be over at a reasonable time. I don't want to cast some pub game that's going to be like an hour wrong and everybody's doing really stupid things. As a whole, these pro players are very, very talented at Dota 2, and uh, we can just use them as a, as a general guideline example. So, Talking about creep last hitting, um, I just pulled up a scoreboard here on the left side. It's called last hits and denies. Last hits means how many creeps they've killed. I told you that these give you gold, but I didn't tell you how you get it, and the way is being the last person to kill it. It doesn't matter who does the damage to something, it just matters what kills it at the end. So, as you can see here, watch this little creep here. There, that plus 45 gold, that meant Ush here got the last hit with Drow Ranger. 
He was able to be the last one to kill the creep. It's going to happen again here as this creep dies. You'll see a little bit of gold boost, and you'll see a color based on who got the last hit. You can only see this as a top down. When you're playing, you can only see if you get the last hit, basically. Unless we get a deny, you see the little exclamation point there? That means that you are the one, you last hit one of your creeps. You don't get the gold for the creep, but it prevents your opponent from getting the last hit. So it becomes a little bit of a battle to see who can last hit at the perfect time. If you miss it and your opponent gets the deny, then you get a little bit less experience and you don't get the gold. If you get the last hit on, on your enemy creeps, then you get the gold and you get the full experience. So it's really important that you're very good at last hitting. If you're not good at last hitting, you're not going to get gold as fast as your opponents, and it's going to hurt your overall gold gain. So that's where some skill comes into play. So if we look at the last hits in the mid lane, we have 23 slash 7, 24 slash 7, about to be 25 maybe? Nope, 24 slash 7. This means he has 24 last hits, and the second number is denies. On my resolution of screen, all these stats are in the bottom right down here, 24 and 7, as I select Shadow Fiend. If we check to see how Ush is doing on the Draw Ranger, he's 16 and 4, and you can see that by finding him over here. 17 and 4 now. He's got 17 last hits and 4 denies. So he's denied his opponent 4 times, but he's also gotten 17 last hits for himself. So he's farming okay. The Shadow Fiend is doing a little bit better in terms of last hitting. So... Now these aren't the only creeps in the game, there's some other creeps, there's some in the jungle here. These creeps are quite a bit stronger and they also don't give nearly as much gold uh, in, in reference to how much HP they have, but they give a little bit more experience on average. So sometimes it's not very safe to stay in the lane, you can go into the jungle instead and farm these. And especially later in the game when you have a lot more damage, you can farm jungle creeps really fast. And Dread's doing a really cool thing here, this is called stacking. Now at the, at the top of every minute here, these camps check to see, is there anything here? And if there's nothing here, it says, okay, respawn it. So what you do is you trick the game by pulling the creeps out at the perfect timing, and right when it hits the one minute mark, the creeps spawn again. And then they run back, and all of a sudden you have three creeps here. And you might say, like, oh, that's hard to kill now. How are you supposed to kill that? Well, the way you kill it is usually with a hero like Shadow Fiend. He has these spells. They're called Shadow Rays, and they do AoE damage. You'll see him cast it sometimes. It'll be a little burst of fire coming out of the ground. He probably won't use one for a bit, but you do end up using it sometimes. And what he can basically do then is he can go to this later and he can use AoE to kill it. Because then it's not about right-clicking. Right-clicking meaning your physical attacks every time they throw out an attack like this. Every hero has a basic attack. Um, and it's this number right here. This is how you can see how much damage it does. Every hero has a basic attack, but it doesn't do AoE damage unless you buy certain items. So to kill these, you usually need a hero that has AoE abilities. And here, Dread is going to stack this again, because he knows that when the Shadow Fiend hits level 7, he's probably going to come do these camps. And he's going for a rune right now, we'll talk about that in a second. But again, pulling the camp out, stacking it, bam, it respawns. Now there's four stacks here, which means that later, when Shadow Fiend comes here with his Shadow Raises, you can be able to farm that very, very rapidly. And this is one of the cool ways that you can kind of help out your carry as a support hero. Ogre Magi here is being a, is a support hero. He's just stacking the camps so that the Shadow Fiend can come over and kill us. And let's see how much gold he gets from this. He's at 1300 right now, and now he's going to start doing AoE damage. And now all of a sudden, because Dread has been very active in stacking, he's helped out his mid-hero by getting him a lot of gold. And I, he actually spent his money a little bit too fast here, but he basically, spent, this is about 1550, and this is 100, so he had 1660. He basically got about 400 gold from that stack, and he got a whole level from it, which is pretty big. So that helped him out a lot, and that's something that you can do to increase your carries farm. Just, uh, there's a lot of different ways to get gold, essentially, and it's not just about getting gold in the safe lane. So something that's going on right here, these are the these are the dire heroes, they're actually ganking right now. I see a little bit of a dream coil. And that was the gank. That's another way to get gold. A little bit of damage here going to disruptor. It's being chased down by this here, the bat rider. So that's another way to get gold. Uh, I said that at the beginning, but you can also kill your heroes. There's been a couple kills this game. HR has gotten three kills here at the top, and Fire has gotten two kills. This little yellow pip means that it's a best of three, and Fire won the first game. So we'll, we'll just ignore that for now. But basically they said, okay, we think the Shadow Fiend's getting too much farm. He just got his hand of Midas, which accelerates his gold gain. He's probably killing stacks, which he did. So they said, Let, let's gank him. So what they did was the two supports on fire decided to roam, which means they left where they were normally sitting at the top lane, and they roamed to the mid lane to set up a gank. And what that basically means, a gank means, is that you show up and you try to kill them. And if your gank, gank is successful, the enemy hero dies. He loses gold. He's also not farming while he's dead. Those are the shadow races again. He's not farming while he's dead. He loses gold because he dies, and your opponents gain gold from killing him. It's a really, really big deal. 
if you can kill your opponents, it really slows down their snowball. And what snowball means is, it means your ability to gain gold in the game. It's like what I talked about before. It's where you have a gold advantage, and then you get more gold advantage, and then you get more gold advantage. And with all those advantages, it becomes very hard for your opponents to get a kill, or very hard for your opponents to, to win the game, essentially. So you want to get gold advantages where you can while limiting your opponent's gold advantages. That's that's part of the efficiency about winning Dota. So, um, so I talked a lot about gold gain. Uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about towers yet. I just said that you have to kill them. Let's use a tower push on the top lane, for example. This is something HR is doing right now. Tower pushing is really important to do because it gives your whole team gold. Now, well, look at the little look for a little symbol above their head as soon as this dies. Bam! See those two numbers. 358 for the Darkseer and 160 for the Ogre Magi. The Darkseer Gorek got 358 because he got the last hit on the tower. Again, last hitting, very important. But everybody else on his team got 160 for the tower dying. So if your tower, if a tower dies, it does two things. First of all, it gives your team gold. And it's a lot of gold, by the way. Keep in mind, when he killed this whole stack, he only got about 400 gold from it. And that took a lot of work from two heroes to do. A tower dying means everybody gets 160. You get 400 about or less. For the last hit and not only does it give you gold but it also opens up the map so now there's no big tower sitting here which means that fire doesn't have vision of this area anymore because their tower is gone they also can't teleport to it we haven't seen any teleports yet to my knowledge but there are teleport scrolls here almost every hero will carry it what it allows you to do cost 100 gold after a short delay you can teleport to a nearby tower so that means that if there's any action going on on this part of the map the closest place that fire can now TP to is over by this tower. So killing a tower not only gives you gold, but also gives you a lot of map control and map vision. So that means that now, HR can basically spend all of their time in this area, in this area, without having to worry about dying, which means that's two new camps here that they feel safe farming, because fire can't just teleport behind them. So that's a good reason to push towers. Pushing towers can be pretty tough, sometimes it takes a lot of seers, some TP is going on. Looks like there's a little bit of a gank on the bot lane. The Disruptor ended up dying right here, and they TP'd to try to catch somebody, but Fire was very good, and they escaped immediately afterwards. So that was really well done by them. Oh, I didn't know people are actually getting Soul Ring on Shadow Demon. Huh. Interesting. I guess that kind of makes sense. I guess I kind of go back to base a lot. Alright, that's irrelevant. That's way over your level. I'm just geeking out a little bit here. Uh, what was I talking about? Okay, we're talking about farming, talking about taking towers, we talked about ganking, we talked about observer words really quick, these little things on the ground. You can only see these if they're yours or if you have the right detection. You can buy these in the shop, called observer words. You can also buy sentry words. Observer words are the yellowish ones, so you can tell them by the yellow. They have different cosmetic skins, but they all look about the same. What they basically do is they give you vision, even if nothing's there. They, it's pretty much just line vision, you can't see through trees or anything like that. There's a couple spots around the map that are better than others, but it's important not to let your opponents know where you place wards, because you can also place sentry wards, these blue ones. And these don't actually give you uh, vision, what they give you is uh, true sight, or they let you see invisible things. There's some heroes that can be invisible, but these are invisible, like I said before. So if, you play, if, if your enemy places a sentry nearby where you place an observer ward, they can kill it. And that's a big deal, because these have a limited cooldown, they're, or they're, they are on a cooldown, so there's only so many that you can have at a time. So being able to kill your opponent's Observer Wards operates similar to killing an enemy tower. It's not as good, but it's very good, because it prevents them from seeing where you are. And knowing where your enemy team is is really important, because it helps you dodge ganks, it helps you set up ganks, it helps you initiate or be the first to start the fight, which can sometimes make a big difference in a team fight. There's a lot of really good things that Vision provides, so you'll see a lot of Observer Wards on the map. At lower skill levels of Dota, you won't see a whole lot of Observer Wards, just because people don't know how to place them, or they forget, or they don't care to do it, or they're greedy. But as a whole, you'll see people definitely going uh, for a lot of Observer Wards in a high level game. So. That's Observer Wards. Um, we can take a look at the gold graphs really quick. You won't be able to see these in game, but they'll kind of help show you what's going on over the course of the game. This is kind of like our recap for the course of the game. So if we look at the start of the game, it was completely equal, and things are going up and down based on how well the last hitting is going. And then we can see that the Radiant Team HR got a gold advantage, and they got more of a gold advantage. It's probably when the stacks started dying or something like this. Uh, where did the SF die? It was, it was over here, I think. Yeah, SF, this is when the Shadow Fiend died, so this big group up was from the Sacks getting killed. And then a couple more farming, and all of a sudden, Fire's been getting a big advantage. And it's been going down and going down and going down.
So while the graph is a really good way to see how the game is progressing, you can't see this in-game, and you kind of have to just judge how things are going. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. First of all, you can click on enemy heroes. There's nothing wrong with that. If you can see them on the map, you can click on them. So right now, Fire can click on this Juggernaut. But as soon as he leaves the safety of these creeps, they're not going to know where he is anymore, or if he's not within ward vision. He is still a little bit in ward vision here, but now, bam, he's in the darkness. If we look at Fire's vision right now, they can't see him at all. They have no idea where he is. They can't click on him anymore. That would be cheating if they could. Like, I can click on him because I'm an observer, but they don't actually know where he is. So you can check on people's items while they're visible. You can see how many items they have. You can guesstimate, oh, he, he got that item now? He's farming really fast. I know that I have to be a little bit worried about him. And that is just how you play. And also, knowing where there are uh, forces you to adjust where you play. For example, they don't know Juggernaut's here, but he's about to show himself. He could maybe get a kill on Puck if Puck wants, but now Puck's going to see him. He says, oh, this hero's here. Why is he here? This is really dangerous of him. But he doesn't want to chase that. It'd be a little scary. Again, he's gonna got a blink dagger item, so lets you teleport a short distance. If you don't take damage, very importantly. So we talked about gold graph. Uh, EXP graph is also usually pretty mirrored to the gold graph, but this basically means how often you're getting experience as a team, uh, based on you get experience whenever creeps die, whenever towers die. I think whenever heroes die, definitely things like that. Um, when, when experiences drop, by the way, it's split evenly with all of the allied heroes in the area. So, for example, if these creeps are dying, only us is getting experience right now. So, if three heroes are in the same lane, they split that experience three ways, which means they don't level very fast. I had to sneeze. Okay. Or is the smoke a deceit? This is the thing that you may have seen the supports using before. What they do is they pop it, and it makes them invisible to observer wards and to creeps. Creeps are these little guys again. Observer wards are again these. I mean, it lets them basically move across the map and not be spotted in what they're doing. It's really, really good. Um, but you can't, they're limited similar to observer wards. So fire basically smoked all the way to the top lane here in hopes of catching an enemy hero, but they didn't show up. So they said, okay, well, I guess they didn't defend. No big deal. And now they're going to teleport to the bot lane to defend if they can. We're going to see a TP defense here. Radiance top tower is under attack. There's an observer ward down over here as well. Uh, is this a radiant one? Can't see on the map. So many icons in the way. You see what fire's doing though? They went to take their own tower. They got it. And now because HR is pushing a tower, they're going to defend it. Because they just got a tier 1 tower, which is an advantage. And now they want to continue pushing their advantage if they can. They do lose the tower. They lose a the lion as well. It's another way you can get out of battle. If you think you're going to die, you can teleport home. So that's what Fluff and Stuff did here. He said, oh, I think I'm going to die. I'm going to teleport home. So he, he TP'd home. Um, if your opponents can't kill you in time or they can't stun you, then you get out. It's only It only works if they don't have a stun. And those two heroes didn't. Uh, Disruptor only has a stun with his glimpse. And the Juggernaut can only stun with his ulti, his Omni Slash. But he, only, he already used Omni Slash and he had already used Glimpse. So Shadow Demon was able to just teleport home and he made it. Because he didn't die in time. So that was pretty well played by him. Jug might be in some trouble here. They ended up killing the Juggernaut there. See, in that case, he used his first skill to become magic immune. It's called Blade Fury. And it ma makes it so people can't cast most spells on you. So he first casted Blade Fury, and then he teleported home. So the only way for fire to kill him there was for right-clicking, or their basic attacks, because those are physical damage, and they go through magic immunity. And they happen to do barely enough damage. It's similar to what almost happened to Fluff and stuff when he was over here. He almost died, but he teleported home in time. It was very close. Uh, we can talk about skills a little bit now. Uh, most heroes have very, very basic skill progression. They have three basic skills, and they have one ultimate. The ultimate you can only get at level 6, and then at 11 and 16. That's the only times you can level the skill up. It's very powerful in comparison to your basic skills. There's a lot of basic skills that are very, very useful as well. But as a whole, you'll only see... Um, 
as as what was I? I don't know. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know where I was going with that. Basic skills are basically very basic, and your ultimates are very strong. So the the fourth skill or the last skill is usually the ultimate. But some heroes have a bit more than that. Puck has an extra. I, uh, an extra icon here, this allows him to, it, it's an interaction with his first skill, so sometimes it looks like a lot of heroes have way more abilities, like Shadow Fiend for example, he's got, this is all one skill basically, but it has three different buttons because it does three different things, and this is one skill, one skill, and his ultimate, so it looks like he has a bunch of skills, but he really only has four, one, two, three, four, essentially. Um, all the other heroes are pretty basic, Shadow Demon, uh, Shadow Demon has an extra one as well, this is based on his third skill. So it might look a little confusing at first, but most heroes do only have four skills. So there's some heroes that are exceptions to this that are really weird, but they're they're very few and far between, so don't worry about them too much. So if you want to see cooldowns and things like that, just look at the icons. Um, we'll see some cooldowns here. This one's on cooldown for 35 seconds. Uh, his all of his abilities are off of cooldown. We have a Barretter going in. He just uses ultimate. It's on cooldown for 72 more seconds here. His little numbers in the bottom right is the mana cost, if you're curious. The mana is the blue bar here. The red bar is HP. Probably should have mentioned that before. <laughs> HP meaning health points. So the, the green bar is health points, blue bar is mana points, or MP. The MP lets you cast spells. Green bar is how much survivability you have. Uh, well, that's not exactly true. It's how much HP you have, how many health points. Your survivability is based on a lot of other stuff. I talked about... Uh, I'm, I want to move away from this because I want to talk about it a little bit. I talked about physical damage a moment ago and magical damage where I talked about the Juggernaut Blade Fearing. There's three types of damage right now. There's physical, which is your right clicks, and there are some spells that do physical, but largely it's just right clicks. This is physical damage. You've got magical damage, which is, let's find an example, uh, Shadow Rays, for example. These, these spells that he's been using is magical damage. That's magical damage. You can read it by, if you look at the damage type in there, it says it. Magical damage. Doesn't pierce spell immunity. That's magic, and the third type is pure. And I don't know if there's any pure damage in this game. I don't think any of these heroes have pure damage. So, no pure damage in this game. Um, with the exception of Soulcatcher, I guess, but that's kind of irrelevant. Don't worry about that. Um, there are some spells that do pure damage. What pure damage does... Uh, well, first of all, I should talk about magic. The way that magic works is it does damage, but everybody has innate magic resistance. So if we look on here, on the bottom it says magic damage resistance. Almost every hero has 25% magic damage resistance. So it's something that basically makes spells a little bit worse. For example, that was almost all magic damage that was done. The Lion has a Finger of Death that does 600 magic damage, it's really high. It's reduced by 25%, so it only does about 450 damage, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, it does 450 magic damage after reduction. So magic damage is kind of peaks off a little in some ways. You have to calculate that into how much damage you do. That's magic damage. The reason that pure damage, the way that pure damage works is, it's similar to magic damage, except it isn't reduced by magic resistance. So that's why pure damage is pretty cool. So, physical damage, magical damage, pure damage. Those are the three damage types. Physical is reduced by armor. This little uh, symbol here, it's like a shield symbol. It says five plus four. Armor, people's armor varies a lot based on their items. This armor, this item gives four armor, for example. Um, you've got magic resistance. Everybody has magic resistance, but there's items that do increase magic resistance, like the cloak here, 15% spell resistance. And pure damage just goes through everything. So pure damage is very good uh, in almost all situations. So those are the three damage types that everybody does. Again, so you have HP, 
physical is reduced by armor, magic is reduced by magical, pure damage is uh, goes right through all that. That might be a little bit more advanced than you're looking for for this game, but since we have a lot of time until this is all over. Oh, it's good. He heals himself. That's good. You see a lot of 5v5 going on right now. It's very different than the beginning of the game. That's because at the at the beginning of the game... At the beginning of the game, you see laning. Um, the laning stage is very, very over. The laning stage usually only lasts until about 13 minutes, but... There, it's just a lot of fighting going on in this game. The laning stage is, is basically the beginning of the game where everybody's really low level and they don't have a whole lot of items. But now that it's later, everybody has a lot of items. They can fight. They want to take towers. So you see a lot more 5v5 is what it's called. They're team fighting. And the teams want to get together and they want to fight. Because if they have 5 heroes there and your opponents only have 4 heroes there, you have a better chance of winning the fight. So a lot of the teams will fight in the mid to late game to try to get advantage where they think they have advantage, where they think they have tactical advantage. There's a lot of little stuff like that that they'll be going to take. Uh, to take advantage uh, in a Dota game. So that's why we're seeing so much fighting between Fire and HR right now. They think they're stronger, and they want to take fights because of it. So. Fire Raider's a pretty cool hero. This little trail of fire thing. So we see in the Shadow Fiend pick up more and more items. Um, one item that you'll see sometimes during fights is the Black King Bar. It turns him into this big glowy yellow hero. It's similar, it looks similar to how his hero looks, except it'll be yellow and glowy. What that does is it makes you magic immune for 10 seconds. Um, what that basically means is that most spells that your opponents use won't do any damage to you and they won't affect you in the slightest. So that's one way to counter heroes that have a lot of magic damage like Lion. You can say, oh, he's just gonna... He'll hex me, which turns me into a fish. And then he'll earth spike me, which stuns me for two and a half seconds. Stunny mean means that you can't do anything else for that duration. If you grab a Black King Bard, then those spells won't work on him. And it allows him to actually fight during the fight and do what he wants for those ten seconds. And that's really important. Because you need to be able to cast the spells that you need to cast in a very short amount of time. If the fight happens and you're stunned the whole time, and then one or two of your allies dead, then your damage output that you should have had during that period is gone. So sometimes an item like a Black King Bar is really important. And this item in particular gets weaker and weaker the more you use it, because it's a little strong in a lot of ways. So the more you use it throughout a game, the lower the duration goes. So as he uses this, it's going to last for 7 seconds, and the next time he uses it, it's only going to last for 6, and the time after that, it's only going to last for 5. So looks like we have another, another gank here going on that's on the Juggernaut. He's going to end up dying. And again, Lion uses his Finger of Death, and Ix Mike the Bat Rider uses the Flaming Lasso. So, really, really good skill for getting kills. It basically holds your opponent next to you, and you can pull them to your allies. So not only does it stun your opponent, but it also allows you to force them to be out of position. Uh, position is something, positioning is something that is, uh, isn't talked about a huge amount, but it's really, really important to talk about in the context of a game. It's, it's almost more valuable than gold or experience sometimes because um, positioning is, is basically how far away you are from your allies. For example, Shadow Demon was completely out of position here. He was up top farming by himself and the entire enemy team killed him. In some ways this is okay because Shadow Demon died and in the meantime they were able to kill the enemy team's carry or the Juggernaut who's far more important than Shadow Demon is. So killing him was a big deal. But him dying over here means that he was out of position. He was somewhere he shouldn't have been where his opponents are safe to engage on him and kill him and escape immediately afterwards. So positioning is really important, and that's why the flaming lasso is really important. If, if five heroes are standing here on one team, and the other five are standing right here, and all of a sudden the bat rider jumps in and he pulls one of the heroes closer to his allies, his allies can just focus them really fast and kill him. So positioning is a really big deal, and that's why we see a lot of items like blink daggers on heroes, because they allow you to get in position the right at the right speed. Um, even items like Yasha, this gives you movement speed, allows you to walk to a position a little bit faster. And it may seem small, but it's actually a really big deal if you have a movement or position uh, positioning advantage over your opponents. So they know where the dire team is. This is the dire team again, on fire. Fire this game is dire. So they're gonna move towards them, looking for a kill. Let's see if they can catch anybody. Nope. Didn't get him. The Radiant team has an Observe Ward up on the hill here, which allows them to see fire. If we look at their vision here, they can see a couple of these guys. Dyer's middle tower 
And HR wants to go for a mid push here. They kind of want an engage before, but they couldn't find their opponents. He's got a new item now, it's called Butterfly. This is a 6,000 gold item, it's very expensive. Gives some evasion, damage, and attack speed. Gives him some armor as well. What evasion does is it means that your opponents can't always hit you. Ooh, that's a good green pull. Caught four people with that. Trying to figure out if they want to fight these guys here. And there we go again. The ogre was a little out of position. The bat rider blinked forward using his blink dagger. Used flaming lasso and then forced staff to pull them both back to safety so that they could kill him for free. Kind of like a deep creature in the night horror monster sort of thing. He just snatches you and takes you somewhere dangerous and then kills you. So there's a lot of heroes that play very differently and I'm sure you guys can see that as well. Um, some of these heroes are more mobile, some are more right-clicky. Shadow Fiend, for example, kind of just walks places and right-clicks them. It's like, oh, I'm just going to kill all these things because I do a lot of damage every hit. And now he's like two-shotting creeps. Two-shotting means that it only takes two of his right-clicks to kill a creep. So he's doing a really good job with that because he's gotten a lot of items. And he's done a good job keeping his farm up or his, uh, his overall net worth. We can actually check the net worths here. You can only see this in the scoreboard again, but he has, he has the highest net worth this game. That means he's farmed the most creeps and he's gotten the most gold. So he has the most items, he has the most gold in his bank. This ignores uh, levels or anything. We can check EXP per minute. He has the highest experience per minute as well. So there's a couple of things that we can track online. Or at least uh, in the Observer. But we'll pull back up last hits again. So yeah, a lot of the heroes play very differently. A Juggernaut, for example, is more about right-clicking enemy heroes in close proximity since he is a melee or a uh, close-range fighter. Shadow Fiend has a ranged attack, so he sits back a bit more, but still does really good damage and is fairly survivable or tanky. It means the same thing. It means that you're less, uh, you're more resistant to damage essentially. Uh, Disruptor is more of a uh, team fight initiator. His main skill is the glimpse skill. You can pull people back and get them out of position. It's kind of like Batrider Lasso in a way. Ogre Magi has a lot of stuns and nukes and things like that. He's very strong and tanky himself as a support hero. He can also buff his allies to give them attack speed and movement speed. It's his third skill here. Observer Ward getting killed here. This is one of Disruptor's abilities as well. Prevents your opponents from walking through it. I mean, there's so many heroes in the game, and that's, that's what's cool about it. You know, I, I mentioned before that the map is entirely symmetrical every single game. But what's awesome about it is that um, you can pick new heroes every single game. So even though this game looks really standard, um, or maybe like, oh, are all the games like this? It's not exactly true. Um, the, games, the games vary by quite a huge amount. You can pick a different support for each team. You could lane it differently. Like, for example, this game, they put Dry Ranger in the mid lane at the beginning of the game. They could do it completely different. They could put Dry Ranger on the safe lane. And they could put the puck on the mid lane instead. They could have done that if they really wanted to, but they didn't. Um, there's a lot of variability, or maybe the early game would go better. I mean, you could basically replay this game with the same players, the same heroes, and it would be very, very different the next game, guaranteed. Um, it's always going to be slightly different. And that's one of the cool things about Dota. It's that every, every game might seem semi-similar in a way, but they all get very interesting and different. So they just smoked in there trying to get a, get a kill on the Roshan. But they thought the opponents were doing that. They're scattering out now. We're going to see a fight. Here it comes. We'll probably see Batrider going first. Because Batrider is going to want to pull somebody. He doesn't have Firefly for a bit though. This is a big loss for him. He needs us to run over the cliffs. Oh, here comes the fight. Oh, ooh, big mistake there by Disruptor. Here comes the pull, maybe. Let's think about it. Here it comes.
That was a really cool fight. That was actually a really cool fight. I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. That was a really high-skilled fight. I mean, look how low his HP was. He had 80 HP. If he had one less item for survivability, he would have died there easily. Um, there's just a lot of really clutch things going on. The interaction is basically how well you can use all of your abilities. You don't get out of position. They get out of position. They're trying to right-click you. You have enough survivability items. It just gets so complex, and getting to this point was so hard. It takes so much skill to even get to the 34-minute mark against both of these teams. So being able to get here is just such an awesome mastery of last hitting and farming correctly and ganking and defending pushes and team fighting. There's so many things that go on to this moment. That's really what makes Dota really beautiful. Like, that fight was so cool. I was watching the puck most of the time. He's staying alive for as long as possible. He's trying to waste his opponent's time. Because if three heroes were standing around trying to kill him, that means his other four heroes were probably killing the other two heroes. There's a lot of little cool things that, like that that you can do to um, make your team fights go a little bit better. Just really cool. Really cool fight. So, Draw Ranger, for example, not doing the best, 1, 5, and 6, but it's okay because he has this Precision Aura, which gives all of his heroes, which are all ranged, by the way, bonus damage. So, if you look at Shadow Demon, he's getting 63 damage from Precision Aura. 63 damage is a lot of damage. For example, if we look at a... where is it? A Demon Edge? Can I even see it in here? I don't think we can. I have to go to the Secret Shop and click on it. A Demon Edge, for example, gives you 46 damage. It costs 2,400 gold. So, he's basically giving them, like, a... A 3,000 gold item, essentially. 63 damage is actually, like, yeah, 3,800. He's basically giving everybody, like, a 3,800 gold item. Because he has four skill points in here, and it's boosted because of all this extra agility that he's purchased. So, it's pretty cool. Despite him not doing very well in KDA, that's kind of the point of his hero. He's just supposed to give his allies damage, and uh, he can come and do ranged attacks later. Stuff like that. Pretty cool. Seeing a little bit of... Oh, this is weird. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there are some problems in the in the land. Everybody disconnected from this game. So we can just speed things up. Watch the clouds go really fast and stuff like that. And back down to regular speed. So Yeah, Dota's a really cool game. I, I, I really like it personally. I don't know if you noticed this. I've been making videos about it for like four years. And there's always new stuff to learn. Um, even when things get a little stagnant, sometimes, for example, Juggernaut is really powerful right now and everybody thinks he's overpowered, at least in public games. But, I mean, Fire's doing a good job against him, in my opinion, and and even if he is the strongest tier in the game, he may get banned a lot in Captain's Draft, and what's going to happen eventually is every couple months, a hero that is too powerful will get nerfed. What nerfed means is they'll be uh, reduced in strength and effectiveness. So Juggernaut, for example, is probably going to get nerfed again. He just got nerfed. He may get nerfed again. Um, if he does get nerfed again, then he's going to be even weaker, and then there's going to be some other hero that gets buffed. Buffed is opposite nerf. It means that somebody that's too weak is going to get buffed. So, for example, um, Barrett, well, Barrett has been nerfed pretty constantly, but a uh, hero that got buffed is Juggernaut, actually. Juggernaut got buffed for, like, a year or two straight. He got a little buff, and a little buff, and a little buff, and a little buff, and all of a sudden people are like, whoa, this hero is really good, and they started picking him all the time. So little things like that change, and then... All of a sudden, right when everybody's getting sick of Juggernaut, there's going to be some other carry that pops up, and it's cool. Oh, cool, this hero never gets played, and all of a sudden he's going to be popular again. So the game gets really, it gets stirred a lot in a good way, uh, because the heroes that may not be popular at one point will become popular again. Shadow Fiend for a very long time was not picked at all, but he got buffed enough where he's now popular again. Or maybe not popular, but some people do pick him. And it's cool to see all the tier teams have different um, heroes that they like and different synergies, and they develop strategies, and they play them differently than other people. Like, remember when I saw that Shadow Demon got a Soul Ring? I was like, cool, he's got a Soul Ring. And I sat there and I thought about it for like 10 seconds when I should have been talking about Dota. And that just intrigued me. I was like, oh, why is he getting Soul Ring? And I thought about it. It gives him more mana, and with that more mana, he can cast more Shadow Poison, which means he doesn't have to go back to base as often, but... The important part is he can sit on farm, so with the soaring, when nothing's happening, he can just farm jungle camps, for example. So I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. By buying an 800 gold item, it allows him to increase his efficiency rate, and he has more mana, so that he can always be on the map, he doesn't have to go heal, he can always be team fighting. And, like, there's so many cool little inferences that you can get about every single item, so it's really fun to watch other people play as well, just because of that. Especially pro games, because all these players are better than us, so... You can see what kind of cool things they're doing, and you can attribute that to, um, to your game, so... One of my favorite ways to look at video games is the fact that if you talk about professional sports, for example, football or basketball or whatever, it's really fun to watch those sports, but unfortunately you can never play them, even close to the same level. I mean, even getting, uh, for American football, if you guys don't know, it takes uh, 11 person per side. When's the last time you've ever seen, like, 
anybody actually feel the love in people you see like two on twos four on fours with your friends and in grade school or high school or whatever it's very rare that you get to play the actual game the way it's supposed to be played and that's one of my favorite things about video games is that you can watch the professionals play and say like oh my god ix mike has the second best mustache in the dota scene and he's pretty darn good at bat rider he's 4 2 and 11 he's doing really good this game i want to do what ix mike did and I'm going to try it out. And you can go into a game and you can try to replicate it. And you have the entire ability to do that. And that's one of the coolest things about video games. And Dota especially. And other games like it. Um, you can try to replicate those things. That's really cool. I really like that. So uh, hopefully this gives you a pretty good understanding of how complex Dota is. But how simple it is as well. It's very simple. But it's hard to do it correctly every single time. And that's where things get difficult. Is, is being able to, uh, to do that effectively. He is really farmed. He's actually spent a lot of time farming this game, and it's almost entirely because of the soul ring, I must say. So that's that's pretty cool. I whenever I play I play Shadow Demon a lot right now in public games. I never have this much farm, and it's pretty much because he has uh, he did get the soul ring, and he just goes around farming all the time. If we look at Disruptor, for example, this hero is not very good at farming neutral creep, so he mostly has to stand around and wait for team fights. So this hero, in comparison, hasn't been able to get as much, and that's why he's died twice. He died once here because he was out of position farming, and he died once here because he was out of position farming. But he has so many items that it's okay. It's like, oh, you died once in a while? Well, whatever, you were getting last hits and gold, and that helps your team win the game. That's pretty cool. So, uh, what a cool thing. The only problem is that now he's all the way across the map and his team is about to go high ground. High ground meaning you go from the low ground here to the high ground. Killing the barracks are really important. I can't believe we haven't had a barracks die yet, so we can talk about that now. Vodka break. Um, they played this game in Kiev in Ukraine. Um, Dota very popular in Ukraine. It's pretty cool. Um, but what bar barracks are very important. They're arguably more important than the Ancients because it's kind of like a means to the end. Um, if your outside towers die, it's not the end of the world. When your towers die, it gives your opponents gold and map control. But when your barracks die, this means that all the creeps that spawn for your opponents are a lot stronger. So it's a little counterintuitive. You'd think um, that, oh, if these barracks die, then your creeps would be weaker. It's not like that. It's the opposite way. Um, if you kill your opponent's range barracks, then your opponent's range creeps that spawn will then be stronger. If you kill their melee barracks, your opponent's melee creeps that spawn will be stronger. So it doesn't completely make sense, but it makes it's cooler that way. Because the creeps getting weaker isn't isn't very smart. The other cool part is that they become they have more HP, they do a little bit more damage, and they give less gold and experience, which is really important. So if you racks an opponent, which is short for barracks, if you racks an opponent early on in the game, it means that their opponents aren't going to get as much gold or experience from that lane for the rest of the game. And lane creeps are way more gold and experience than neutral creeps are, which we talked about earlier. Every single one of them is between 30 and 45 gold, something like that, or 49 or something. They're a lot. Watch how much gold these are. 39, 53, 39, 44. These neutral creeps, they, this one right here is about 50 at tops, 50 or 60. And it's a big creep, it has 1,000 HP. There's a lot of pauses going on because of stuff, but that's fine, I can talk about things. Um, um, so killing the barracks is a really big deal. If you kill the range barracks, your range creeps are stronger. If you kill the melee barracks, the melees are stronger. Uh, a little bit of differences between the two. The range barracks has less HP, it has less armor, it also doesn't regenerate HP. The melee barracks, Regen's HP, it has more armor because the melee barracks is a lot more important. And if you look at the creep wave, I'm sure you guys can tell why. It's because there's five melee creeps. If you make the melee creeps stronger, your wave is way stronger. One range creep going up by 50% strength is, is not that much better. But the melee creeps get a lot stronger. Uh, this is a catapult, by the way, or a siege creep. We didn't talk about this before, but what a siege creep does is it does a different type of damage that does bonus damage to buildings. So towers, barracks buildings, things like this, it does bonus damage. So these are really good for coming through and helping you do extra damage to a tower. So these spawn every couple minutes, every three minutes, I believe, and then the, then the rate that spawns becomes different later on. So that's uh, a bit variable there. So barracks is really important. This is why fire wants to go high ground. They kind of want to, but the game's lagging right now, so they feel scared to do it. It is actually a hard to rex, though. It may not seem like a big choke point, but this is actually a very narrow point in the game because if all of your team has to go uphill, there's two problems. First of all, you're clumping because it's narrow. And second of all, you don't have vision on the high ground. If we look at, if for example, if all fire is standing right here, they won't be able to see up this cliff here. And this is the case for all the points on the map, which I didn't cover earlier. Happens for the mid lane as well. If you look at these creeps right here by fire and we look at the, the vision of fire, this is all they can see. They can see a little bit of stuff because fluff and stuff is standing here. But these creeps can't see up this hill because they just went downhill. And these creeps can't see up this hill because they're not quite uphill. The only reason you can see this is because of where Fluff is standing, I believe. Or he, he must have casted a Shadow Poison or something, which gives vision. So, vision is a really big deal. Um, you can't see uphill. 
unless you have some kind of uh, like uh, above ground vision, like Shadow Poison, for example. When you cast it, it gives you vision where the cloud goes. So, so going uphill is scary for two reasons: you're clumping, and you don't have vision always. And also, if your opponents want to buy back and teleport back in, they can teleport anywhere here or anywhere here. So it's very easy for your opponents to reinforce if the fight happens. It's that base advantage. You're close to their base. Therefore, if they come back, at worst, they'll respawn right here whenever they die. I guess I didn't even talk about that. If you die, you're not dead forever. You just respawn. I should have covered that. I'm sorry. It's so hard to think that base. I, I try to focus on more advanced things usually in my videos. So um, thinking about base things that are that that basic are, are very difficult sometimes. So I'm sorry about that. But yeah, you respawn, as I'm sure you can tell. I've pretty much everybody's died this game. I'm sure everybody has. If we look at the scoreboard, yep. The second number is how many deaths you've had. So everybody on, everybody in the game has died at least once, and everybody has at least one kill. The third skill is, uh, third number is called assists. What that means is you helped kill somebody, so you did some damage to them before they died, for example, is the best way for assists to get tracked. So uh, a really good score to have is usually more deaths, more kills than deaths, and then more assists than deaths as well. Most uh, support heroes will have way more assists than deaths if we look at Shadow Demon, for example. He's got way more assists than deaths. This is a good kill-death radio ratio for a support hero. Even though he has less kills than deaths, it's fine because he has a ton of assists, so this is good. Usually you want your carries or your cores, uh, your cores being the three heroes usually that farm on your team. You want them to have more kills than, way more kills than deaths if possible. But for supports, it doesn't really matter. And again, don't just look at the scoreboard and assume that this is um, this means that somebody is doing only so good. For example, there's some games where a hero like Darkseer at 3, 4, and 4, it may seem, oh, he's not doing that good. But for all you know, the way that he's impacting the game is really significant. So don't don't look at the numbers and just assume that it's it means uh, a huge, it means everything about the game. Because it all depends about who you're playing and how you played in your game. And that that's something that takes eyes and uh, good Dota eyes to understand. You have to understand um, you have to understand uh, what what it takes to be good uh, just by seeing seeing good players kind of and you have enough experience and stuff like that so uh, the numbers can tell you things but it doesn't tell you everything so I'm gonna speed things up now since we've been paused for a billion years looks like they're playing it out uh, they had some leg issues while they're there not too unsurprising and we'll see if uh, the game gets rounded up. Oh, we just had a Rashawn die. I don't know if you saw, but there's a little red item in there. It's called the Aegis the Immortal. It's this big, this big monster here. We did see him get killed once by the Dry Ranger and the Shadow Demon. And what this monster does is every time you kill him, it's about equivalent to getting gold from a tower. And when you kill him, it gives you experience and gold. And then you can pick up an item called the Aegis of the Immortal. And what it does is, if you die, it lets you respawn right where you were standing after 5 seconds, without losing any gold or anything. So it's kind of like having a second life in a fight, which is a, a bit of a gold advantage, or a bit of an advantage, because if it takes a lot of damage to kill Jar Ranger, and then she respawns immediately afterwards with no loss to her team, other than being out of combat for 5 seconds, it's a big advantage for Fire. So if Fire can take map control, and they can take Rashawn every time it's up, and take the Aegis, and take that into the next team fight and fight pretty well with a gold advantage, there's a really good chance of winning. Oh, do they actually load? Is this how this ends? Well, that's anticlimactic. Alright, so apparently what happened was because the game was having trouble uh, finishing out, they ended up loading from a save, which didn't get saved to the ticket. So I thought this was going to be a completed game, but it's not. But that's fine. We don't really need it. Well, seeing the game end would have actually been really, really constructive for the first ever uh, video of Dota, but I guess we'll cover that a different day. Basically, the barracks dies, your creeps get stronger, you get inside the base, and then that lane constantly pushes in because the creeps are stronger, and eventually you see the Ancient fall. So in our first game of Dota 2 tutorial, we will not actually see the Ancient die. But that's okay, because we covered a lot of other stuff. So um, I'll make another one of these videos probably in a week or so. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this. Hopefully we'll have a big playlist of really basic casting here to explain a lot of really basic aspects of the game. We covered gold gain, covered experience gain, we vaguely covered roles and supports, uh, we covered... Uh, towers dying, why it's important. We covered skills vaguely. I guess next time we'll cover skills. We'll cover uh, roles a bit more. We'll cover cover maybe pulling and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover. There's so much stuff to cover, but I think that's going to be it for this video. Sorry we didn't see an Ancient Fall. Uh, that was my fault. But I didn't check the games out before I, before I looked at them. I just kind of was like, oh, this looks okay. Anyways, uh, that's it for today. 
My name's Perch. I make instructional Dota 2 videos, and I hope you guys learned a lot. Um, I'll be back tomorrow, and uh, thanks for watching. See you in a bit.